Um, now, if you have a bucket list, I'm willing to bet it's a pretty good bet that you don't have an entry on the bucket list for look through a telescope someday. And I can understand that. We've got the internet, we've got uh, science books coming out every week, We've got the Hubble Space Telescope pictures, which are fantastic. I love looking at them. By the way, thank you all for helping to pay for that. Um, but what's really inspired me is the fact that instead of looking at pictures, we can ask people to come by the telescope and look at the real thing. Um, once you've seen the moons of Jupiter or the, the, the rings of Saturn or, or even the craters on the moon, you can uh, think of those as real places, places where a child might even dream of exploring someday. So that's really what's inspired me, is the reactions of people who come by the telescope and look through it, perhaps for the first time. But uh, we've got a kind of a chicken and egg problem here today. We're indoors. I can't just invite you all up here to look through the telescope and let it do the talking for me. So I've come up with a plan that I hope will do two things. First, it will inspire you to add that missing item to your bucket list. And second, it will hopefully demonstrate to you that some of the concepts in astronomy that you thought were, well, astronomically hard are actually pretty easy to understand. And by the way, I don't want you to think that you have to look through a giant telescope to make this happen. This picture of the moon was taken right out here on the centennial courtyard through a telescope maybe a quarter the size of this one by simply holding a cell phone up to the eyepiece. That's what you'll see when you come to some of our, some of our events. Um, here's some pictures of some folks who've stopped by the telescope uh, on various places. The middle one is in downtown Manhattan, where ignoring strange people on the street is something of a survival art. <laughs> um, but from the people who do stop by, I, uh, I've, I've come to the conclusion that the ones who just walk on by are maybe allowing a, a fear that we've all remember from, from school days uh, uh, take over their natural curiosity. Uh, that's uh, not the fear of public speaking, but it's the fear of asking a dumb question, right? We all know there's no such thing as a dumb question, but still nobody wants to be the person who stands up and asks one. So um, my plan today is to try to answer for you the three most commonly asked questions that I hear on the sidewalk when we're out with the telescopes. If we can accomplish that today, then next time you see someone standing on the corner with a telescope, You'll have three good reasons to stop by and talk to them. And you can pick a fourth question to ask that maybe we've never heard before. So here's the first question that I get asked very frequently. Is there something special happening tonight? I usually answer, yes, tonight and tomorrow night and the next night too. Um, we, uh, we live in the age of the Internet. You all know this. When, if you've heard of a New York Minute... Well, an Internet Minute makes a New York Minute seem like it lasts for a week. Um, the media likes to talk about events that happen now, tonight, today, breaking news, trending on Twitter. What is Twitter, anyway? <laughs> um, so what we're going to have to do to discuss, to, to kind of address this issue, is to talk about timescales that are a little longer than the ones that we're maybe used to hearing about today. So we'll start with a little animation of how the planets move around the sun. Now you all learned this in third grade, that all the planets orbit the sun, so we all know that, but I'll just point out two things before we start the animation. Uh, the first thing I'll point out is I've marked Earth's orbit here. There's Earth, marked Earth's orbit in this, with this blue line, so you'll get an idea. We're the third rock from the sun, remember that. And the other thing I want to point out is that the outer planets, Saturn and Jupiter and Uranus and Neptune, are actually much, much farther away from the sun than they are here. We brought them in so they'd all fit on the same slide. Um, Jupiter's five times farther from the sun than we are. Saturn's nine times farther. Neptune is 30 times farther from the sun. 
So you can see we'd need a much bigger screen. We can't do that. So we'll start the animation. So here's our animation. And what you can see here is that um, the Earth is orbiting, orbiting the sun here, obviously. And every time we make a full trip around the sun, you and I get to celebrate another birthday and perhaps the arrival of a few more gray hairs, or in my case, the departure. Um, you'll notice that uh, Mercury and Venus are, are, are closer to the sun than we are, and they're, they're orbiting around quite a bit faster. Um, if you've ever rolled a coin down one of those spiral wishing well ramps at the mall, you already have a whole intuitive understanding of the physics behind that, so we don't need to explain that at all. But notice the outer planets, uh, Jupiter here and, and Saturn. Hardly moving at all. And those bright outer planets are the ones that we're usually showing people in the telescope, either the moons of Jupiter or Saturn's rings. So other than the moon and, Ver and Mercury, things in the sky pretty much stay the way they are from night to night. And this is reassuring to people. So I can say to them, if you miss this tonight, we'll be back next week. We can still show you Saturn. We can still show you Jupiter. Uh, the moon might be in a different place. But uh, it's reassuring so that folks know if they take up the hobby of astronomy themselves, they can miss a little bit and they can come back a week later and still see the same things in the sky. Now, if the planets do that, uh, maybe won't the stars uh, operate the same way? In fact, they do. Our, um, our sky is, is divided up into constellations, of course. But before we go forward, I'll just make two points. One is that what we call constellations, astronomers actually call asterisms. Those are the patterns of stars that we recognize. Orion's belt, the, the Cygnus, the swan here as well. Constellations, they, they use that word for a different term. Those are these uh, kind of artificial boundaries. They're like jigsaw puzzles. They cover the whole sky. Um, and uh, and they, they map all the sky, and they basically divide the sky up into these various sections. So constellations are these areas, and the asterisms are the patterns that you see. Now, here in this, this beautiful hand-drawn diagram of something that, even if you're not into astronomy or navigation, you've probably heard of, the, constel of the, the, the term the celestial sphere. That's just this imaginary spherical surface on which you can map all the positions of the planets and the and the stars. So here we've got this celestial sphere drawn by a, a fantastic artist, Guy Ottowell in the UK. And here in the middle there's the sun, and here in purple is our Earth's orbit. And the fact that Earth makes a trip around the sun once a year is the important fact in determining whether the sky stays the same from night to night or from season to season. So when, we, when it is summer, we are... Um, on the, on the near side of the sun here, there's Earth right here on the near side. Here's a little, little blow-up of that. And the direction of night, which is always away from the sun, is looking out towards us, out of the screen, towards the, ver the side of the sphere where the letters are backwards. And we would see constellations like Cygnus and Lyra and Hercules. These are our traditional summer constellations. But let's fast forward six months to when the Earth has now gone around the sun halfway and we're on the other side. Now the direction of night is in the other direction. This little pie-shaped object kind of describes the section of the sky that we can see. So in the, in the winter, we're looking the other way, and, and we see only the constellations on the far side of this celestial sphere, and there's Orion, and there's Taurus, and Gemini. These are the traditional winter constellations. So this is also reassuring to people because we can say to them, look, if you uh, miss some constellations on this side, and there are interesting things there, we can let you go uh, a year later, we'll be back around on the same side of the sun and you'll get another chance to see the same things again. So the, the hobby is a lifelong hobby and, and it, since we're traveling around the sun once a year, you get multiple chances to see these kinds of things. Now these are the 88 modern constellations. You've all written them down, memorized them, they'll be on the quiz. Okay. So the second most commonly asked question I get is, what is that bright thing in the sky? Let's talk about Venus, first of all. Right now, if you go out uh, here in uh, the month of September 2015, you can see Venus in the early morning sky. It looks like a giant airplane headlight, but it doesn't move. It just glows there. Um, and, and this is a picture of what it, what it looks like pretty much right now. Um, I have a little animation here that'll show us uh, uh, Venus, but here's uh, beforehand. I've drawn on here the evening sky on this side, the morning sky on this side, and Earth rotates this way. 
So let's start this little animation. So here's what happens. Venus is orbiting closer to the sun than we are, and so it goes around the sun and it catches up with us about every 19 months. When it's on this side of the sun over here approaching us, it's visible in the evening, and then something mysterious happens. It completely disappears from the sky for about eight days, and then as it recedes from us, it starts to become visible in the morning. For this reason, historically, Venus has had two names. Even though it's not a star, it's been called the evening star and the morning star because it, it switches from being visible in the evening to visible in the morning. And it's extremely bright because it's, uh, it's quite light colored. Uh, Venus's cloud cover is white. It reflects something like 90% of the light that falls on it. So it's extremely bright in the sky. And as it passes us and, and, and begins to recede in the, into the distance, it changes shape as well. You notice that it, it appears to be a crescent when it's coming around here on the left side and the right side, and then a full Venus when it's way on the other side of the sun. When Galileo saw this 400 years ago, in 1610, he was able to conclude from this that Venus had to circle the sun. The fact that Venus shows phases means that Venus does in fact circle the sun and not some point halfway between the sun and earth as earlier theories had postulated. It was the presence of the phases of Venus that was one of the keys that cons convinced Galileo that the sun was actually the center of what he called the universe and what we now call the solar system. Another thing that bright thing in the sky might be is the planet Jupiter. These four moons of Jupiter we now know today and we call them the Galilean moons. They were first seen by Galileo of 400 years ago again. But when Galileo saw them, I imagine he might have thought to himself, well, those are just four stars behind Jupiter. And as Jupiter moves through the sky, it'll leave those stars behind like it leaves all the other stars behind. And it will, um, but it, it didn't happen that way. <laughs> These four stars followed Jupiter. And in fact, they kept going back and forth. Sometimes they were all on one side and sometimes they were on the other side. And so he noticed that they, he concluded they must be moons of Jupiter. And so here's the first observation of something in the solar system that didn't orbit Earth as everything was thought to do at the time. Here's a bigger picture of Jupiter, and you might even be able to see over here the shadow of one of Jupiter's moons being cast on it from the sun, which is over here someplace. Easy to see in your small telescope as well. And if Jupiter's in the sky, we love to show people that sort of thing. When Galileo made these conclusions, he immediately wrote a letter to his, uh, his mentors and sponsors, the de' Medici family, explaining to them how he saw these moons on one side or the other. And then he published his book, The Starry Messenger, and made his diagram showing how he saw these moons on different sides of Jupiter at different times and was able to conclude again that this was a, a place where something was orbiting something besides, besides Earth. Um, and here in this little animation, which uh, I hope you can see the little dots of light moving around, this is an animation of how the moons move. One second of time in here is equal to about an hour. And so you see the, the moons of Jupiter go back and forth as if they're on railroad tracks from, the position of, from our perspective here on Earth because we're seeing those circular orbits from the edge. We're seeing those circular orbits edge on. And so unlike, I guess, uh, down here, we can see them actually. This, this is an image of what it would look like if we could float over Jupiter's north pole and see the moons making their actual circular orbits. But from Earth, we see the circular orbits edge on, and so it looks like the moons are going back and forth on railroad tracks. When they're going from left to right, they're in front, and when they're going from right to left, they're behind. Another thing that might be, uh, that, might be that bright thing in the sky is the planet Saturn with its rings, the beautiful rings. And in a small telescope, you can sometimes even see the Cassini division that divides the rings into inner and outer rings. Um, one of my favorite things to look at in season. And of course, that other bright thing in the sky, which people don't usually ask, what's that, would be the moon. Um, here's our picture again, our cell phone picture over here. And here's a, a, a series of pictures taken by my good friend Ed Ting of 14 clear nights in New Hampshire when you were able to see how the sunlight changes its position on the moon as, as the moon moves its, around the earth and we see this half-lit moon from different angles. Um, here, let's zoom in a little bit more uh, and you see um, that the craters on the moon are, are most, uh, most easily visible just to the left of this line which we call the terminator. That's sunrise on the moon. If you were standing on that line, you'd be seeing the sun rising and you'd be casting a long shadow behind you like, like you do when you go to the beach early in the morning. And that allows us to see these craters lit from the side at a low angle. 
And so we see the bright rims and the dark bottoms, and our brains are programmed to know what that is. We say, that's a hole. I'm not going to step in that. Dark bottom, bright rim. So the craters, even though the whole moon is covered with craters, and you can just barely see them over here, but over here it's already noon on the moon, and so the sun is very high and there are, there's no shadows. It's like going to Death Valley at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. So we see, and every night we get to see another set of these craters because the ones that are hiding over here just outside the Terminator are going to be visible tomorrow night because this Terminator will move about that far as the moon moves around the Earth. So every night you get a new view of the moon's craters, a whole different set of craters. Quite exciting to see. If we zoom in a little bit more, we can see a couple of these large areas that, are made up, that make up the uh, eyes and nose and mouth of the man in the moon. And this is um, uh, the Sea of Tranquility where we first landed on the moon and the Sea of Serenity, uh, Apollo 11 landing site there. No, I'm sorry to say you can't see the flag on the moon from any place on Earth. That, that is actually the number one question I do get asked. I have to be honest with you. So the third question that I get asked is this one, which I love to hear. Are you going to be back here again tomorrow night? If I hear that, I know that I've made some sort of a connection with the folks who've looked through the telescope, and I'm, I'm very pleased, and, and hopefully we will be back the next night. I'll quickly take you now through a 10-year trip through my history. I looked through the telescope for the first time in 2007, and when I did that, the planet Saturn was up here in front of a bunch of stars that make up the constellation of Leo. You see uh, Leo here, it's kind of shaped like the lion's head with the feet. And as the years went by, every year I would go back out in May and look at Saturn, and you'll notice that Saturn will move through the sky. The other stars don't change, but Saturn's moving because Saturn's orbiting the sun. And so in these 10 years, Saturn made about a third of an orbit around the sun. And in these 10 years, my older son got married, I have a beautiful granddaughter, my younger son graduated, is ready to graduate from college and finished his work in the Navy, and my father turned 100 years old. He'll be 101 next January. And so Dad has been alive now for almost a quarter of the time that since Galileo first saw the moons of Jupiter. How much we've learned in such a short, short time. So I'll leave you with this final picture. This girl came to visit my telescope on the Hampton Beach sidewalk uh, on 4th of July. Biggest fireworks of the year. We were all set to uh, show people Saturn while they waited in line. Lines were long at the telescope. She arrived at, got finally to the, to the front of the line just as the fireworks started. I had plenty of time to take this picture because she never turned around once to look at the fireworks that she came to see. She was captured by the beauty of Saturn in the little telescope. I hope that you have as, as rich and interesting an experience when you get a chance to look through the eyepiece as she did. Thank you.